do a service focused around the notable people who died during the past year on the first Sunday of each year. Although the service may seem newsy and secular, our reason for doing it is sacred to all whose theology is humanistic. Though this, through this service, we appreciate humanity by remembering who we have lost. We celebrate the human spirit by remembering the remarkable deeds, great courage, creativity, and sheer hard work that makes the human enterprise. Each year, we hear words of hope. Someone crafted the legal arguments which dismantled racial segregation. Someone enforced the Clean Air Act. Someone, a 22-year-old someone who was in the right place at the right time, wrote women's rights into the Japanese Constitution after World War II. Someone started the first hospice program in the United States. Someone galvanized Hispanic youth with her amazing voice and verve. Someone hid children in her classroom in a closet and shielded them with her body. Someone fought to discovered that fluoro chlorofluorocarbons were going to ruin the atmosphere and fought to have them banned. There is nobility and hope for the human race. Thousands of notable people died last year, most beloved and many who are very important and far, far too many to mention all here. We who plan the service choose the ones who have touched our hearts. This service is one of the most labor intensive services of the year for lots of people. And let me begin by thanking all of you who called interesting obituaries to our attention throughout the whole year. And for Shirley Roof, who carefully saves the milestones page of her Time magazine every single week of the year for probably 15 years she's done that. And I also want to have a special shout out to John Roth, who's our projectionist. Being the projectionist in a service with 125 slides is a nerve wracking experience. <laughs> And I hope you'll all be nice to him after the service. <laughs> so here we go. Tom Davis, a comic who wrote, who died at the age of 59 last year, wrote, I wake up in the morning delighted to be waking up, to read, write, feed the birds, watch sports on TV, accepting the fact that in the foreseeable future, I will be a dead person. I want to remind you that dead people are people too. <laughs> there are good dead people and bad dead people. Some of my best friends are dead people. Dead people fought in every war. We're all going to try it sometime. Fortunately for me, I have always enjoyed mystery and solitude. So here's to dead people. Like Robert Bork, who is most famous for losing his nomination to the Supreme Court, but who made an enormous mark on American jurisprudence. From teaching Bill Clinton and Hillary Rodham in law school, to minding the legal affairs of the Romney campaign, to his friendship with Anton Scalia, he was an intellectual giant of the conservative movement. And while he rejected the right of privacy, being a strict constructionist, when his family's movie renting records were made public, the Video Privacy Act soon became law. <laughs> Warren Rudman was a long-serving moderate senator from New Hampshire. A colleague said of him, there are elected officials who can rise above partisanship, who define the national interest as just that, the interest of the nation, and act on it. We could use a little more of that these days. Arlen Specter was a long-serving moderate senator from Pennsylvania. He knew that when he voted for the stimulus package that he was signing his political death warrant, but he did what he believed was necessary and right. Senator Daniel Inouye was the Senate's oldest member when he died last year at the age of 88. A teen when Pearl Harbor was bombed, he was barred from enlisting in the army because he, an American citizen of Japanese descent, had been classed as an alien. Angry, he and friends petitioned to be allowed to enlist and serve in Europe. He won that battle, 
and fought some real battles with great heroism, but no awards were given to his unit of Japanese Americans for 22 years. Amazingly still a patriot, he began his service as senator from Hawaii and became a household name in the Watergate hearings and again in the Iran-Contra affair. He was a vigorous member of the Senate and his death took his colleagues by surprise. Another Japanese American, Gordon Hirabashi, refused to s register to be sent to an internment camp during World War II. He was convicted of this crime and had to appeal it twice. It was finally overturned in 1988. At that point, the government paid reparations to still living American citizens of Japanese descent who had been interred. As he said, it wasn't the Constitution that failed me. It was the people who were placed in the responsibility of upholding the Constitution. George McGovern lost the 1972 presidential election, but he and his supporters saved the Democratic Party chaired by chairing the McGovern Commission, recommending reforms in party practice to get input from women, minorities, and young people, setting the stage for politics as we know it today. The world of religion lost a number of very interesting thinkers and doers. Beverly Harrison was one of the feminist ethicists and theologians who most influenced me and my generation. Her course in theological ethics was one of the best courses I took in my theological school years. She ran afoul of the president of Boston University, John Silber, who also died this year, and she moved to Union Seminary in New York. An important part of her life can be summed up in the title of her best-known essay, The Power of Anger in the Work of Love. Three men in successive generations of theological development died this year. William Hamilton was the major theologian in the Death of God movement in the 1960s. He wondered if the guy in the sky conception of God really worked, and that was very radical in his day. Paul Kurtz, a philosophy professor who was a rapacious critic of religious belief and pseudoscience before the current atheist power era, died this year. He was the principal author of the Humanist Manifesto II, which was signed by many famous figures in 1973. He was also the editor of the magazine Skeptical Inquirer, which was a favorite of Unitarian Universalists through the 1980s. And Christopher Hitchens would not like to be introduced among religious people. But his atheism, which was really more of an anti-theism, kept him in religious news for a decade. During his final illness, he held firmly to his belief that this life is all there is, but he softened enough to appreciate that people were praying for him. Jan Bernstein artist and author with her husband of 300 children's books, all about the very traditional bear family, mama, papa, and two little bears, finally a third little bear, who confront all manner of traditional kids' issues. The visit to the dentist, sibling rivalry, and on and on and on and on. These books, <laughs> these books are staples of children's lives and waiting rooms and a boon to parents who need to appeal to a higher authority about such things as brushing teeth, which is just something that bears like to do. <laughs> the Bernsteins even eventually took on some social issues later in their career. In 1994, a panda family moved next door. Maurice Sendak, who also died this year, took a completely different approach to children's books, filling them with fantasy images which alarmed parents and fascinated kids, who are well aware, after all, of the monsters in their closets and in their minds. We did a service here a couple of years ago about Sendak's wild things, and here they are, mourning their creator in inimitable Sendak way. The animatronics expert who created E.T. died this year. Carlo Rambaldi later created models of tortured dogs so realistic he was charged with animal cruelty and saved from prison in Italy only by bringing his models into court, a first time a special effects artist had to prove that his work was not real. 
And speaking of movies, the person who did Darth Vader's sword fighting for him died this year. Bob Anderson started his career training Errol Flynn, moved on to Darth Vader, and ended his career working on the Hobbit movie. He was 89. Sherman Hemsley, the actor who played the patriarch on The Jeffersons, a popular 11-season TV series which took on the racial tensions in the 1970s, died this year, as did the actors who played Andy Taylor, the sheriff of Mayberry, North Carolina, in Quentin McHale, commander of McHale's Navy, in respective TV series. Jim Drake, who helped to design both the Tomahawk cruise missile and the windsurfer sailboard died this year. As did the inventors of, of addiction medicine, the first effective drug treatment for HIV, the Red Bull energy drink, and the first actually portable computer to have a laptop's clamshell design. It cost $8,150. And notice the phone on the side. Other inventors who died this year included the creator of Captain America comic, the um, innovator of Cracker Barrel restaurants, the psychiatrist who started the first hospice program in the United States, and the virologist who discovered that genetic mutations cause cancer, as well as the surgeon who did the first live human organ transplant. That was 1954. They all died this year as well as the psychiatrist who first took what we now call transgendered people seriously and named the phenomenon of, of gender identity. Stanford Oshinsky, an iconoclastic, largely self-taught and commercially successful scientist who invented the nickel metal hydrate battery and contributed to the development of a host of devices, including solar energy panels, flat panel displays, and rewritable compact disks died this year as well. That's a lot of inventions for one person. Nobel Prize, Prize winner Rita Levy Montesini died this past year at the age of 103. An Italian Jew, she enrolled in medical school in 1930 despite her father's objections. He believed that the role of women was to be a wife and mother and not a scientist. She earned a degree in medicine and was barred from practicing by Mussolini because she was Jewish. She chose to stay in Italy through the war and continue her work alone, building a lab in her bedroom. After the war, she moved to the US and won a Nobel Prize for her work in physiologist, physiology. Although she retired in 1977, she never stopped working and once attributed her success to endurance and a habit of underestimating obstacles. The last surviving veteran of World War I died this year in Britain at the age of 110. And in the animal world, Lonesome George, the last surviving peanut island giant tortoise died and his species with him. George was 100 years old. Sally Ride was the first American woman in space, and presumably the first lesbian astronaut. And she was also the youngest astronaut to be launched into space at the age of 32. She devoted her post-NASA career to encouraging children, especially girls, to pursue careers in science. She survived by her partner of 27 years, their relationship only made public after her death. Janice Voss was a frequent flyer on the shuttle in the 1990s and also died this year at the age of 55. Neil Armstrong was an early astronaut who made that one giant leap for mankind by walking on the moon. He died this year at the age of 82. These three actual astronauts surround a painting of Ray Bradbury, and he, it's exactly what he would have liked. Ray Bradbury is best known for his science fiction, but he wrote in many genres. He never went to the moon. He never actually even went to college, but he did read a lot. He was a bit of a technophobe. He never learned to drive, and he once said that he wrote about the future in order to prevent it. <laughs> but he did love the space program.
the people who died this past year that our Associate Minister, Reverend Angela Herrera, chose. <clears throat> Anthony Shadid, a two-time Pulitzer Prize-winning Lebanese-American journalist, died this year. It was not in the way that one might have expected based on his adventurous life. Although he was shot, kidnapped, stalked, and tortured in the course of his career covering the Middle East, he died in Syria from an asthma attack. Shulamith Firestone died. Firestone was a firebrand, a radical feminist, whose 1970 book, the dialectic of sex argued, among other things, that sexual inequality stems from the onus of childbearing, which fell upon women by pure biological happenstance. She envisioned a future in which new humans would be conceived and grown in artificial wombs, liberating women from pregnancy and birth. Life on the front lines of second wave feminism took a toll on Firestone, Struggling with mental illness, she eventually retreated into a solitary life and became an artist. Her book, however, is still required reading in many college courses. And Eugene J. Poli, father of the